Hello and welcome to the seventh and final lecture of the HG Bionet 2018 lecture series on conducting class studies. Today's lectures will focus on the statistical methods used for various types of genome-wide association studies. Um, just some quick house rules before we commence with today's lecture. Please keep your microphones on mute to prevent any background noise from interfering with the lecture. If one would like to ask a question, uh, please click on the press icon on the top ribbon and choose raise hands or you can type your questions in the chat box on the side and we'll pause during the lecture to address these questions. When the talk ends, the meeting room will be closed and automatically redirect you to an attendance form. Please select the correct lecture and register your attendance to this lecture. Um, there have been some requests for the lecture slides. Um, Ishu Barnett is currently working on implementing an online repository for materials which is very compliant and the slides will be made available through this repo and the URL shared once they're up. So without further ado, we're extremely lucky today to have Dr. Sheikh Lokabar providing today's talk. Dr. Sheikh is a mathematician with a PhD in statistical genetics and he's currently working at the Institute Pasteur de Dakar where he has the Biostatistics, Bioinformatics and Modeling Group. Sheikh also teaches statistical genetics and biostatistics and our statistical softwares in the master's programs at the University of Gastonberger de Saint Louis and the University Sheikh Anna Diop in Dakar. Sheikh's research group focuses on the development of statistical methods and tools for genetic association, analysis of infection diseases traits, and his group is involved in a number of GWAS studies within Africa. Uh, without further ado, Sheikh, over to you. Uh, okay, thanks uh, Sumir for the introduction uh, and uh, welcome to every participant. Uh, so I will be happy today to, to present you this lecture. I think it's one of the last uh, from the series of lecture that, that you start uh, following since a few weeks. Okay, so um, let me start now. So I will present to you statistical methods that uh, are used for genome-wide association studies. And it's in general also these um, kind of statistical models uh, that I will show will also work for studies that are not genome-wide, like even if you are analyzing uh, candidate genes, if you have specific SNPs that you already selected um, based on some biological hypothesis. So it's also the same kind of, of, of approaches you are working. You will have less issues and you will see that in the course many of the statistical issues will rise because of the, the nature of uh, the genome wide, because of the number of tests we are performing at the same time. Okay. So and please, if you have uh, a question, you can uh, you can raise hand during the presentation, and then I can sometime stop and answer to the question, and sometime I can keep it uh, for the end. Okay. So this is a brief outline. So I will first give you a recap of the type of GWAS. I think you already uh, seen that with uh, Professor Vishal Ramsey for the second talk. Uh, I will make a brief recap on that and then I will show the type of statistical association uh, methods that are used depending on the different type of GWAS. Uh, mainly it will depend on design, etc., and the nature of the variables you will see. And then we will uh, see how to handle uh, covariates and what what is the, the why it's important to incorporate covariates in the analysis. Yeah, you like to correct for confounding, for example, some of the effects can be. Um, just due to difference of age and for this kind of study you have to adjust for age for example. I will also present you the principle of uh, multiple testing, why we have multiple testing when we are doing GWAS and what is the definition of multiple testing and what are the used methods to handle multiple testing. 
and finally i will show you some and i think you you are you already seen that i saw that you have already seen the visualization uh, uh, approaches like manhattan plot locust bin plot so i will be very quick on that and will show you some tools that you can use to perform gwas and what i what are the file formats and the output for gwas Okay, first, first of all, uh, what is association? When, when we are saying association studies, when you say that your, your marker is associated to the disease, so I'm using the term marker instead of SNP because it can be generalized to all the... <clears throat> okay, sorry, the voice is not clear, so... Uh, we try to talk directly without the hear on. So is it is it better, Gamal, Gamila? Yeah, that's better. So I, I can speak directly uh, like that. Okay, good. Thanks, Fuzia. So uh, when you when we are saying association between a marker and a disease, so here I'm not using the term SNP because I'm just making a generalization. It can be a SNP or another type of marker like multi-allelic markers, etc. So when you observe association, it means that the marker is associated to the disease or this is the direct association uh, or the marker is in linkage disequilibrium with, uh, the, with the, 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 the site which is associated to the disease. And this is indirect association. So this is in general uh, the type of association. Uh, and in a, a statistical definition for association is just any relationship between two measured quantity quantities that show them statistically dependent. Uh, is equivalent to correlation. So when you have correlation between two variables, then for statistics you have association. And we have main uh, GWAS characteristic uh, concerning the statistical side. You have other characteristics of GWAS that are not statistic, but for statistics you have large sample size requirement. You have um, no uh, no prior no prior knowledge. That means uh it's like hypothesis free you 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 start by uh, without any um, any hypothesis on the on the data on the snips you don't know which one is associated to the to the disease and this uh, you also have the raise of uh, several statistical issues that are presented here uh, so some issues and consideration is the management of large data sets, which is uh, a little bit tricky. Uh, data quality control, controlling for confounding like uh, age and sex. Sometimes also you have the correlation with other variables that can uh, bring some some confusion in your in your results. You also have the problem of population stratification that can be handled by the principal component analysis method. Uh, you also have a linkage disequilibrium problem, and uh, in general, you we use LT pruning to just select uh, markers, uh, SNPs that are that are independent in uh, given a threshold of LD. Like we can fix uh, an LD of uh, 0.5 and say until and select all SNP that are at least that uh, for which their LD is less than 0 0.05 and then just do the GWAS on these SNPs. You have also cryptic relatedness that can be fixed by including the genetic relatedness matrix that is the GRM matrix in the in, in your in your models and other statistical issue also um, are problem like multiple testing we need to control for the family-wise error rate. 
And for that, we have uh, generally two approaches. We have the Bonferroni approach, the Bonferroni method, and the false discovery rate by Benjamin and Hochberg. So um, there are several types of GWAS, and the difference is uh, due to the difference in these parameters, for example, the recruitment design, the nature of the measured phenotype, uh, and the complexity of the genetic effect you are testing. For example, if you go to the recruitment design, you can have uh, you can have people from the general population. This is the population-based GWAS, and even in that that kind of recruitment, you can have you can recruit case control, and generally they are unrelated individuals. You can also have family-based uh, family-based GWAS, for which the recruitment is uh, uh, you are recruiting related individuals. In general, you recruit one one child which with the disease, and then you also recruit uh, his two parents or, or or his relatives can be sisters and brothers, and you have different type of statistical methods to measure association in, in both cases. You can have also different type of phenotype that are mainly qualitative phenotypes or quantitative phenotypes. Um, can, can you please uh, mute your microphone when you are not asking a question, please? We also have uh, the complexity of the genetic effects that we are testing. So we in G, in, in simple GWAS, it's also named uh, single slip GWAS. We are looking for the effect of one marker at a time. So this is the the main the main uh, the main approach for GWAS, and it is in this kind of uh, of, of analysis, we are using univariate methods. You, we can also have multi-marker uh, multi-marker GWAS, like we are we are looking the join marker effect on the trait. And these approaches are more suited for complex traits. Like if the trait is is expected to be multigenic or multifactorial. Um, the multi-marker multi, multi GWAS will be more powerful to with uh, compared to single marker GWAS. And for that kind of uh, association, multivariate methods are used uh, for testing the combined effects of the different marker. And the different marker can be on the same gene, so you can have the p-value of the gene, which is the overall significance of all the SNPs lying to the same gene, or it can be different SNPs from a selected region of interest. And it can be also a search on the genome-wide level that is more complex, computationally very costly to look at uh, joint effects uh, at the genome-wide level. So if we... Uh, if we start from the very simple uh, from the very simple design, this is the the classical GWAS where we have population based recruitment, case control. We have a qualitative phenotype which is binary, for example, affected, not affected. Uh, and we want to look at single marker effects. So for this design, uh, the data can be pre presented very simply like this way. And for that, the association statistic is a chi-square. Uh, you can make a contingency table counting how many, for example, if you test one SNP, and this will be done for all the SNP. If you have like one million SNPs, you have to do it uh, for each of them. So you can make a very simple contingency table and put the count inside. For example, here C0 is the number of uh, 
cis okay let me use the arrow here c0 is the number of cases uh, among the people with the genotype capital a capital a and etc t0 for the control and then uh, you have the six count for each of the three genotype uh, within cases and within co within controls and this test statistic to measure association here between the SNP and the, um, and the disease here is just a chi-square which is defined like this and I think many people already know this uh, these statistics uh, which is the sum of the difference between these observed counts uh, noted OIJ uh, minus the expected count in each cell uh, at the square divided by the expected counts and this statistics is known to to follow a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom is just the number of row in the table minus one time the number of column in the table times uh, minus one. So here we have three rows so three minus one is two time we have two column two minus one is one so it's two times one it's two degrees of freedom and here you, once you got the the value of x you uh, you have to look at the p value corresponding to x and then conclude for association or not depending on the threshold of significance you you have already defined here just for for an example here if we have this kind of count expected count can this is the observed count for example we have data on 200 individuals and this is the distribution of the count among cases and controls and also among the three different genotypes and here uh, this is the observed count the, this is the formula to compute the expected count here you have to look at for example for the first cell first line first column if you want to have the um, the expected count you have to look at the marginal sum concerning this cell so it's 170 you have to do the multiplication and to divide by 200 the general the, 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 the big total and then here you have four cases with genotype aa the expected count will be 35 and here we observe 20 so we have a significant um, a difference between the observed count and what is expected which is 35 and then etc for the second cell also we have 25 etc instead of 20 Seven. and then once you compute the expected count for all cell here presented in the table on the on the right on the right so if you if you if you if you have the observed count and the expected count so you can quickly compute the value of the test statistic like this but yeah by just for each cell you have the corresponding cell you have to make the difference at the square and divide it by the count in the expected table and then here we obtain a test statistic of value 30 34.86 and we said that it's it follow a chi-square is distributed as a chi-square with two degrees of freedom and the corresponding p-value here is 2.7 at the um, 10 at the minus 8 and here depending on the if we are, we are testing just one SNP so the threshold is 0 0.05 and here it will be significant so for this classical design you we have other association statistics also that are used like the Fisher exact test the Cochrane arbitrage trend test and but for gold standard we are using uh, in practice the Fisher's exact test for case control studies which is more more convenient more is more stringent but it's more secure because it's immune to um, uh, misspecification of the distribution 
because this the test statistic is supposed to to be distributed as, as a chi square in the here this x we said that is it follow a chi square distribution but it's under some validity condition like here uh, all the count in the uh, table at the right the expected count should be greater than five so if you have all of them greater than five so you can say that the test statistic is distributed as a chi square but if you have at least one of them which is less than five so you your 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 your, your hypothesis is not uh, is not true and if you use fisher exact test so it's a non-parametric test so it's more secure to use that So you have also to compute the association measure and here it will be the odd ratio and here you have it quickly on the same table by using this formula. You have just to make the count depending on the two genotype you want to contrast. You can see the odd ratio for that one. For example, here for the for the homozygous of the of the minor allele, you have the count C2 times T0 divided by C0 time T2. And here you can have uh, an application of that. If you have this count, it's the same, the same data that I showed you before. And here you have uh, the odd ratio of the heterozygous capital A, small a versus capital A, capital A is 1.66 while the other one the odd ratio is uh, 7.5 and you also can optimize the coding scheme because here it's like um, an additive it's an additive coding and here you can code your alleles as uh, considering a dominant model for uh, for the for the minor allele if it's a dominant effect you can code it you can merge uh, the allele capital A small a and small a small a and if it's uh, a recessive if you consider a recessive effect of the of the minor allele you can code it like on the top right so you and like this you can we have here a chi-square distribution of uh, one degrees of freedom because we have reduced the table uh, before the table had three rows and now tables have only two rows that we have one row left so it's instead of two times one it's one time one and the number of degrees of freedom and here this is the corresponding odd ratio and the corresponding p-value in the table at the bottom uh, okay here just to show you the the, the, the an illustration of the impact of population stratification on, on on association measure. For example, here, if you consider the table on the top, uh, you have cases and controls, and you have for people having allele A, uh, and for people having small allele A, you have like the count is 100.1 and 20. And for the minor allele, 20 for the cases and 100.1 for the uh, control. And here the corresponding odd ratio is 25.5. That means uh, uh, having the minor allele will increase the disease risk, will multiply the disease risk by 25.5. And if you have this can be the results of uh, two population that is on the bottom. For example, for population one, imagine if you have a population one with this uh, distribution of count, you, you, you have like more people with the capital A allele. And here you can see that the odd ratio is one, so you don't have any, um, any risk, any disease risk increase in the disease risk depending on the alleles 
on the population too also at the at the right you also have the same thing you don't have any increase of the disease risk depending on the allele and if you combine them so you can have this increase of risk which is a spurious uh, association and this is the problem of stratification population stratification this is a quick illustration of that and that's why uh, for for GWAS it's very important uh, to um, it's very important to account for population stratification So for the same design, you can generalize by, um, uh, okay, let, let me just set up the volume. <clears throat> okay, sorry. I, I had one of my students who was listening in the other room, so it was <laughs> the voice it was coming in, in my office. Okay, sorry. So here, uh, to generalize, like if you have case control design and a qualitative trait, which is binary, uh, you can use the contingency table and compute everything you want. You can have the odd ratio, the p-values, etc. And you can have the same thing also by using logistic regression. And the convenience of regression is that uh, we can adjust for covariates. Here we can put additional variables like age and sex to correct for confounding. We can also have explanatory variables that are quantitative. And for that, you cannot make contingency table. And here, for example, the test statistic will be uh, for example, here the, the logistic model is the log of uh, the probability to have y equal 1 divided by the probability to have y equal 0, given that 1 is disease and uh, 0 is not disease, equal alpha plus the effect of the SNP, beta the time the SNP, plus some noise, epsilon. And here the estimation of the effect of the SNP, beta here, if you take it and you divide it by the standard error of the estimates, this gives you the z value, which is, uh, which is um, distributed as a normal, uh, as a standard normal n01. And here, if you take the square of z, it's equal to the x that we had uh, from the contingency table, the chi-square statistics. So with, with the logistic regression also, you have the, the same conclusion. And here you can have, uh, it's more advent, you have more advantage by using reg logistic regression because you can adjust for, for cover, on, for, for, you can adjust for, for cover yet. Okay, yeah, and, for this type of of design, also you can have uh, you can compute the sample size required for 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 your study, and it depends on four parameters. And the four parameters are the uh, the, the the threshold of your of your test, the, the significance threshold here, alpha equals zero point zero five. The target power here, if you want to have a power of 80%, the allele frequency and the effect size. The effect size here is the odd ratio. And depending on these four parameters, you can have the, 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 the sample size that, are, that is required. And here you can see that you will need Uh, the slide seems to be showing on my slide. Okay, do you have problem with the slides? So I'm on I'm on slide 18. 
and it's fixed on my screen. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, and here you can see that if you have uh, extreme value for the mineral allele frequency, or if you have low effect size, you will need more, more sample if you want to keep your power at 80%, for example. And I think you, you had this type of, of representation on the, on, the, on, the, on the course of Professor Michel Ramsey also. So let's move to association testing when is the, the phenotype is quantitative. So it's the same design, you have population-based recruitment, you are testing one SNP at a time and your phenotype is quantitative. And here in general, association statistic is a z-square from linear regression. You can have it by a linear regression or a generalized linear regression if your quantitative phenotype is not normal. Example, it can be uh, distributed as a Poisson or uh, exponential distribution. So if it's not uh, a Gaussian, you have uh, to use a generalized linear model. And here, for example, uh, you can have traits like the blood gly glucose level or the body mass index. And in general, they are Gaussian. And uh, for example, on the right, you can see the representation, the graphic on the right. Here you have the three genotype, the minor allele, uh, homozygous to the minor allele, the heterozygous, and the homozygous to the major allele. And here on the y-axis, you have the, 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 the measure of the phenotype. And here you can see this is the profile of a negative association between the minor allele and the trait. So here clearly you can see that if you have this kind of, of trend, you have association. If the red line is significantly, uh, uh, if there is a significant departure from this line to the horizontal line, you have association. And here, the, the, the minor allele is decreasing the phenotype. So you can also test it by ANOVA uh, to, see, to, 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 see the, to see the association. So in general, uh, we are performing linear regression on each marker by doing the repetition from the from one to the number of SNP that you are analyzing. So your Y variable is your quantitative variable and here you have the, your intercept and the effect of your SNP and in general also you can adjust on the principal component here, PC1 and PC2 uh, to uh, adjust for population stratification. And here the approach is individual statistic tests and after that as you are doing a repetition of, uh, of testing from one to the number of SNP that can be uh, several hundred thousand, so you have to correct for this multiple testing. And later we will see how the multiple testing is increasing the, the risk of false positive. We can see it uh, later in, in this presentation. And we use Bonferroni or gold standard, which is the false discovery rate. So here, um, for if you want to look at uh, the joint effect of several SNP, uh, there are several methods. But one of the one of the the very straightforward method is uh, the one presented uh, in the software Vegas. Uh, this one you can compute uh, the the joint effect of several SNP uh, from your, your GWAS. And it's based on the combination of the individual test statistic you have already obtained from the GWAS. So that's why it's the combining the summary statistics to test the joint marker effects. Uh, for example, if you have, uh, if you have like on one, on, on a gene, if you have like 10 SNP uh, belonging to the same gene, you can combine, you know that 
each of each statist test statistic um, individually is following, for example, a normal distribution. You know that if you the sum of normal distribution should be a normal distribution if they are independent. But here, as they are uh, in linkage disequilibrium, you can have linkage disequilibrium uh, among the SNPs. So you have to use. There is a way to use the the LD matrix and then to correct for for this dependence and to have by reparameterization uh, independent test statistic that you have to 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 square and then to sum them to have a, a finally a one test statistic which is distributed as a chi square and here i just show you the 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 link the reference of of the paper and the software where you can have this method and if you if we change from population based uh, recruitment to family based recruitment uh, testing for one snip the most common and the most known method is the transmission disequilibrium test developed by Spielman in 1993 uh, where we have uh, we have trios so trios mean we have two parents and one affected offspring uh, represented here by this by this figure so you have uh, the mother represented by the circle the father by the square and the offspring in the bottom by the logins and here we have the genotype of the mother is capital a capital a for the father capital a small a and here the the child, the offspring, capital A, small a. And here for the test, the informative event is the transmission of allele from the father to the offspring, because the father have, uh, have, has two different alleles. So the mother is not informative because he will, in any case, transmit capital A instead of capital A, so it's not informative. So here, under under the null hypothesis, under the null, because here the test will look at if there is a preference in the transmission of the two different allele from the parents to the offspring. So if parents have two different allele, we are looking if there is one allele which is more transmitted to the other one instead of the other. So the null hypothesis will be there is the risk of transmission of the two alleles. And then the probability that the children, that the, the child uh, is of genotype capital A, small a, from a parent of capital A, small a, is here, for example, 0 0.05. Under the null hypothesis, because we have only two possibilities for the children capital A, capital A, or capital A, small a. And here, the probability under the alternative hypothesis uh, is just the probability of having, of transmitting uh, small a is different than 0 0.05. That's 0 0.5. So the characteristic of the transmission disequilibrium test is that the offspring is the case he is affected we need the genotype of this offspring and the genotypes of both parents because the test is conditional on the affected child uh, and we don't need to have the phenotype from the parents the the power of this approach is that uh, TDT is immune against population stratification and some confounding due to, to, to sex and age. So if you are using TDT, you can mix different population and you don't care about population stratification. For example, here you can have, um, you can have several 
trios and you can you have to count uh, across your your sample you have to cross uh, you have to to count the number of time the parent is transmitting capital a allel instead of small a and the opposite the number of time a parent is transmitting a small a allele instead of capital a which is the count n21 like number of time allele 2 is transmitted instead of allele 1 and the test statistic for this uh, uh, for this transmission disequilibrium test is a McNamara test which is just uh, a contrast between the number of time capital A allele is transmitted instead of the other uh, between that one that count and the opposite count so the number of time the small a is transmitted and here you can see it's n12 minus n21 the square divided by the n12 minus n21 and it is distributed as a chi-square of one degrees of freedom and you can see that count transmission count from homozygous parents will not contribute to the test statistics this is the um, the first diagonal the n11 and the n22 will not contribute to the test statistic for example here if you in illustration imagine you have here a sample of uh, of individual here for example the the figure the first figure is corresponding to the first line where the father has uh, capital a small a the mother capital a capital a and this offspring capital a small a so we know that the father transmitted the small a and the mother transmitted one capital a and here this count has to be put in this table and then uh, if you do it line by line you will have uh, the 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 final count table uh, like the one in the top right and from the table you compute the test statistic for example here is just the second diagonal who will contribute to the text is 5 minus 6 at the square divided by 5 plus 6 and this is 0 0.09 distributed as chi square 1 and it correspond to a p value of 0 0.76 which is not significant so here we can say that we don't have association between the snip and the and the disease here This is an example, the same approaches on the real data set concerning malaria resistant individual where we had, uh, where we tested the association of the, the, the sickle cell SNP uh, with the disease. And here you can see that um, we had most of time, if we consider people having LL a and LLS, most of time they transmitted LLS instead of LLA, it's 39 and the opposite is they transmitted capital A instead of S, instead of LLS, it's 18 and here the chi-square is 7.74 corresponding to a p-value of 5, 10 minus 3 and it, yeah, and this uh, this showed a significant, a significant association between the HBS locus and the, and, and the malaria, malaria risk. So there are extension of, of this, um, there are extension of this family based association test, which is the TDT uh, by some, by several several authors and the most known one is the FBAT developed by uh, Rabinovich and Lev in 2000 where they put a generalization of this test to include quantitative traits if you use FBAT you can use TDT 
with the quantitative trade and they just uh, do it by 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 divide by developing this test statistic u which is the sum of the trade values the the the, the value of the phenotype time the difference between the observed genotype and the expected genotype given the parents genotype here minus e here in the print i don't know if you are okay i have to use the arrow for example here you have the expectation of the genotype given the parents genotypes and you have to make the difference between this expectation and the observed genotypes and this difference is time the trade value and this will be the test statistic to measure association so here this is uh, the same thing uh, that i explained so the x minus uh, expectation of x given s can be thought as the residual of the transmission from the parental genotype to offspring and which is equal to zero if uh, the parents are not heterozygous if they have homozygous it's equal to zero because the observed genotype will be the expected genotypes that's why they they will not contribute to the test so here you have the Mendel law of allelic inheritance that is the the basis of the null hypothesis which is if you have two different allele you have 50 percent chance of transmitting the one or the other so there is a likelihood version of this uh, transmission disequilibrium test which can uh, allow you to 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 make an extension to several marker to multi marker tests so is the design is like here you have n independent trios parent and affected of spring and you have one biallelic marker so you have two allele a1 and a2 and the events are allele 1 is transmitted instead of allele 2 or the opposite and each of them for each of them you have the corresponding probability probability of transmitting allele 1 instead of allele 2 and the number of times it occurs and here the null hypothesis will be probability of transmitting allele 1 instead of allele 2 equals the probability to transmit allele 2 instead of allele 1 and it's equal to 0 0.5 and the alternative hypothesis is just the two different the two probability are different and uh, this is what we saw before it's just um, a quick recap of of that in 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 another notation so here you have the test statistic the mcnamara test statistic which is the number of time one is transmitted over instead of two minus number of time two is transmitted instead of one at the square divided by the sum and this is a chi square one and here you can write it in uh, likelihood version and uh, once you have it in a likelihood version here you have the likelihood is the probability of transmitting one instead of two at the power number of time it occurs time probability to transmit two instead of one at the power number of time it occurs and then you can derive quickly the log likelihood and under the null hypothesis you have just to replace the probability is by 0 0.5 and it gives you minus log 2 so here you have the log likelihood under the null hypothesis and the difference between the likelihood and the log like the log likelihood of the data and the log likelihood under the null hypothesis will give you the test statistic here this is the x which is equivalent to the McNamara test that we just saw in on the slide before and here the advantage of defining the test statistic here based on the likelihood is that you can extend for multi-marker uh, generalization so here it give it bring us directly to the multi-marker uh, generalization here you have the same design you have n independent trios 
but you have several sleep, several markers to test uh, at the same time. So instead of testing the transmission of one allele, you are testing the transmission of a set of allele here. It's we just put it. Let me move the row. So here you are testing the the, the count, the number of time allele one is transmitted instead of allele two is replaced here by the number of time the set S is transmitted instead of the set S prime. This is the M S S prime, and here uh, is N S S prime, and the probability to transmit the set of allele S instead of S prime also is transmitted here, and you have the same formula of the uh, likelihood here and the log likelihood under the null hypothesis of 50-50 risk of transmission of set of allele and is here so you have i don't know why i cannot have access to the row okay here i cannot move the i cannot move the row to show you but here you have it in the in the last line the log likelihood under the null hypothesis which is minus log two times the Okay, great. So let me try again. Uh, and here it's it's minus log two times the sum um, uh, across all different sets S S prime, and you have the difference of likelihood in the other slide will give you the chi square value of the test statistic so here it was just to show you that uh, in any case uh, you can have an extension of your test statistic to test one single marker uh, to, uh, to 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 several marker you have you can consider together And here I have time to show you the multiple testing principle and the family-wise error rate definition and the proposed method for, for correction. Here the principle of multiple testing is you, you suppose like in GWAS, you suppose that uh, you are performing M independent tests corresponding to the different uh, alternative hypotheses. For example, if you have M genes to test, so you have H1, H2 until HM, you have you are testing them again the same null hypothesis H0. Here H1 is, for example, the gene 1 has an effect on the trait. H2 is the gene 2 has an effect on the trait, etc. etc. until HM is the gene M has an effect on the trait. And H0 is any of the genes have an effect on the trait. So, and you are testing if you will see at least one gene associated with your trait. So here the, the principle is testing each markers, each, testing each marker for association at a given error rate alpha is, is the same, uh, like, is like you, the probability of of adopting one of the alternative hypotheses HI, given that the null hypothesis H0 is true, is the probability to adopt hypothesis I, given that hypothesis 0 is true at the level of alpha. This is when you set your significance threshold at alpha. This is the probability to wrongly find a gene, the false, the, the, the false positive rate. Increasing the number of genes you are testing from 1 to M will artificially increase the probability to find at least one of the genes wrongly significantly associated with the trait. And this is just due to many trials. So a natural way to correct this increase of the risk of false finding is to set a new error rate that is named alpha prime. We can name it alpha prime. And we have to set alpha prime depending on alpha uh, to have at the end alpha prime equal 0 0.05 to have so we have to control alpha prime 
by defining the level of alpha. So, and how we, how we can obtain alpha prime. So, this, this brings us to the definition of what, what's named the family-wise error rate or the genome significance, the genome-wide significance level. So, it is the probability to obtain at least one false positive results and is conventionally expected to be equal to 0 0.05. So, the family-wide, so, so, obtaining at least one false positive, the opposite is to obtain zero false positive. So, it's one minus the probability to have zero false positive uh, given that the null hypothesis is true. And this is the definition of the family-wise error rate. So, if alpha prime is the probability for each single test to be found positively wrong, then the probability to have zero false positive will be the probability to not have gene 1 as false positive, not have gene 2 as false positive, and not have until not have gene M as false positive. And then it's 1 minus alpha prime time, 1 minus alpha prime until the end. So it's 1 minus alpha prime at the power M. And you can easily derive the value of alpha prime depending on the alpha of 0 0.05, which is here in, 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 the, gray, in the yellow area. So it's alpha prime equal one minus one minus alpha at the power one over m. And here this is by defining this. So we have uh, the value that we have to set alpha prime, which is the significance level that we have to choose for each of the SNP to have at the end a general uh, a general threshold of 0 0.05. This is the target threshold. So, Bernforoni will propose just to divide the alpha by the number of tests to have alpha prime. So, alpha prime this is the simplest way. Alpha prime equal alpha divided by m, and it is obtained like this. So, it's just here. It is the the way to obtain it. So, it's uh, the, the the sum of because it's uh, probability to have h1 or h2 or h3 until or hm. Uh, given that H0 is true and uh, they are independent, they are supposed to be independent. So it's the sum of the the sum of the probability is the sum of the alpha time, uh, and you have m again, so it's alpha prime time m. So here you have it easily like this. And you can see that this uh, definition of the family-wise error rate by Bonferroni is very close to the family-wise error rate uh, def uh, defined in, in the conventional way. And here you can see it here in blue and in black. If you plot uh, the value of alpha prime, so the corrected threshold of significance from one gene to one million gene, if you have like one SNP to one million SNP, you can see that using the Bonferroni is okay to replace the family-wise error rate. It's, it's simpler to compute because you have just to take the conventional threshold, which is 0 0.05, and you have to divide it just by the number of, of tests. So another method for correcting for, to correct for multiple testing is the false discovery rate. So after you are performing your your GWAS, so you have performed your M test as described above, and you suppose that you have P SNPs that you have declared positive and N SNPs that you have declared negative, but in reality we have M1 positive, real positive, and M0 negative, real negative. So you can make this contingency table to, to see how many false positive you have among the, 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 the positive declared by your test, the first column. So here, when the null hypothesis is true and you declare positive, that's a false positive, and when the alternative hypothesis is true and you declare positive, that's the true positive. 
in here and you have it and so on you have it for uh, true negative and false negative and once you make this table what the the, the author propose here Benjamin and Oshberg they propose uh, to control the expectation of the false positive uh, uh, divided by the number of false so the rate of false positive that means the rate of false positive the the number of false positive divided by the declared positive given that you have at least one positive uh, finding so that's why it's given that p is positive and this expectation should be less than what c is stated as the first discovery rate the first discovery rate here will be fixed at 0 0.05 so you have to control the rate of the false finding depending on the number of finding you have and this should be less than 0 0.05 this is the idea so i will not have time to go deeply inside but there is a weak control of this fdr this first discovery rate by benjamin and hochberg and you have to follow these steps uh, to find uh, the significance the significant p values depending on this uh, on this uh, on this definition on this approach to control so you have first of all after your gwas you have just to order your p values from the uh, lowest to the highest p value so the best p value to the worst p value and you have to rank them by p first p second p third etc until pm and then you have to find the highest rank first, second, third, etc. So you have to find the highest rank K that you can denote after K star that will satisfy this relationship just after. That means PK, that means the, the, the rank, the P, the rank to P. So PK have to be less or equal that K time alpha divided by the number of tests. Alpha is 0 0.05 and k is the rank so once you rank them you have to find the first uh, you have to to find the highest k so the first time you have uh, pk lower than this 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 relation this this formula k time alpha over m and that that k is the where you have to stop to and you have to adopt all hypotheses corresponding to p first p third p second p third until p k star so all your p that you found above that one uh, you can adopt them as uh, uh, okay here it works now so they are the significant p they are the significant p values so this is another way of instead of uh, finding the p you can correct the p but i will just skip this one because it will take time to explain it will not we will not have time for questions so you can instead of uh, correcting uh, the threshold you can correct the p value here is uh, an algorithm to compute new p values that are the corrected p values and in general software will give you this p value and it also after one after you rank the p value you have just to compute this uh, this algorithm to have new p value that are named p star here by starting from the highest p value to the lowest p value and then before you conclude you have to compare all new p value by the traditional uh, significance threshold of 0 0.05 so here if once you correct the p value you can keep 0 0.05 as threshold but if you don't keep if you don't correct the p value you have to set a new significance level which is the alpha alpha prime so here is just it's just an example of um, an example of use of the false discovery rate here consider you have 10 snip so m equal 10 you have so you have 10 tests and your threshold uh, at the beginning is 0 0.05 the conventional 
And once you run your, your association analysis, you have this 10p value. So it's the first, the two first column. So you have from gene one to gene 10, you have this list of p values. So first of all, you have to rank them from the lowest to the highest. So if you rank them from the lowest to the highest, so gene three will be the first one and then gen 10, and then gen 9, gen 6, 2, 8, 5, 1, 7, and 4. This is uh, the ranking. So it's the third column, the ranking of the gene depending on the p-value. So from the lowest p-value to the highest p-value. So, and you can put the rank. So first, second, third, three, four, five, until 10. And this is the formula that I showed you in the slide before. It's the rank K time alpha, alpha equals 0 0.05, divided by 10, m equals 10. So if you do it here, you have this, and you are looking the first time you will have the p-value here greater than the p-star, and here uh, greater than, greater than the, the k time alpha over m here. And so here it's 0 0.2 is still lower than 0 0.05. Here also 0 0.004 is less than 0 0.010, etc. Until the gen 2, you have 0 0.009, which is less than 0 0.025. But at gen 8, it's the first time we have the gen p value is uh, higher than k time alpha over m. So you have to stop here and you have to adopt all the p-value that you have before. This is the way to, to, to have the, 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 the p-value depending on, the good p-value depending on the false discovery rate proposed by Benjamin and Hochberg. The last column is just the corrected p-value and the corrected p-value here you can see it's constant for this first one and it changed a little bit. And this, if you if you use the p star, the corrected p value, so your threshold will be 0 0.05. And also you can see that you will end up uh, at the same conclusion if you use the corrected p value or if you use a corrected threshold. So this is just a graphical representation of what we had in the table here before. And you have to find the cutoff where uh, the black line is at the top of the red line at the first time. Okay. So I will come at the question after. Okay. So here, if you have these two way of uh, correcting the p-value, so the, the thing is the burn foreign is simple to compute is less consistent if the M tests are not really independent because it's a strong hypothesis uh, uh, to say that the M test statistics are independent because in case of genome-wide studies due to linkage disequilibrium, we know that the tests are not really, really independent. It's conservative. The number of false positive is evaluated with respect to the total number of tests M. So if you have 1 million tests, you have to use it as a denominator. So it's not always appropriate for genetic studies where we have many, many, many genes. So it will always decrease uh, the, the threshold. The corrected threshold will be decreased very, very quickly. And uh, the FDR is an acceptable way of controlling the inflation of the false positive in the context of genetic studies because um, it's, it considers the expected number of false positive only among the p tests that are declared positive, instead of uh, referring to all the m tests that we use. So it's like a, a, you can see that it's a, a, a small difference in the denominator here. For Benforini, you have to use all the. If you have one million SNP, you have to use one million uh, denominator, and for false discovery rate, you have to use the false positive depending on the number of tests that you have declared positive that are less than 0 0.05. So it's more, more less, con less stringent. So I will not come to population stratification. You have already seen that. I saw that you have already seen that with the uh, 
Professor Michel Ramsey and the way to visualize population stratification is PCA and you have you can control it and correct it by genomic control or regression on the principal component of the of the PCA. Okay, so I will come back to the question after. So quickly, this is the graphical representation of the results that are usually uh, performed in GWAS. After GWAS, you have to uh, make a quick representation of the, quant the expected p-value and the observed p-value, so it's a quantil quantil plot to see if you have over, overfitting of your of your, your GWAS, if you have overfitting or not. And you have also a Manhattan plot where you represent all p-value across the genome from chromosome 1, chromosome 2 until uh, chromosome 22, X and Y. Here is an example of, of a Manhattan plot where we have some SNPs on the HLA region here the blue here, the HLA region, we have uh, some genes also that we have here that come out. And uh, the blue line is uh, uh, drawn at 10 minus 6 and the genome-wide significance level is the red line drawn at 10 minus 8. You can also have locus zoom plot. For example, here for the top SNP that we have from the Manhattan plot, you can have locus zoom plot that can be computed using the R software here, and you can see uh, recombination rates in the genes that are around your 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 signal. You can have also table representation of your results, and it's very important to have it. You have to. For example, here you, we take top SNPs from the GWAS, the top four, for which we did the zoom plot, and here you can see uh, the four RS number in which uh, chromosome they are, in which is genes they are lying, their position, the beta value, and the p value, and then the alleles, uh, the call rate. The, the, the percentage of people genotype for the SNP, the mineral alert frequency, et cetera, Hardwell-Berg equilibrium, and then the corrected p-value here is the false discovery rate, which is the, 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 the corrected p-value. So this p-value, if you use this column, you have to compare it with 0 0.05. But if you use this p-value, you have to compare it by the corrected threshold, which is close to and at the minus eight. So tool used for tool used for GWAS testing is uh, you have Plink GCTA to for the for the principal component analysis, and you also have the R bioconductor libraries where you have available set of packages that can do all the thing you need for GWAS. You have it on, on, on R also, like GWAS tools packages. And you also have a function for Manhattan plot, for zoom plot, all graphical representation. You have it on R bioconductor. And file formats and uh, outputs of GWAS are generally exported in tabulated files because you have uh, a lot of data as results, like the results is is like an input file for another program. And uh, after merging the SNP with the quality control files in general, and after merging with the annotation file, you can export your results in TSV or Excel files uh, that are after subsequently used uh, by other software like R to explore the results because you have large files for the results. In general, you, have, you are using a software to explore uh, these files. So thank you for your attention.
Um, so I can come uh, quickly to the question as we have 15 minutes left. So um, first question is the one from Pelumi Oguntune. What happened in case of ties? I mean, if two or more p-values are the same, how do you rank? Okay. So you have just to, or it's for the here. Let me come back to the slide. Okay, here. Okay, here if you have if you have the um, the same p value, so you have just to rank to continue the rank because uh, it will be symmetric. If you use, you will see that. Uh, if one is is greater, okay, let me see. So here, if you have like uh, the same p-value for 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 example from for gen two and gen gen two and gen eight, you have to keep rank five, rank five. So because they will, it, it should be symmetric. So like if you change Gen 2 to Gen 3 and Gen 3 to Gen 2, it should be the same conclusion. So if they have the same rank, uh, they will, the comparison with the K time, alpha time, L, L will be the same. But here, Gen 5, you will skip the rank 6 and just put rank 7. But here you will put 5 and 5, here. I don't know if I uh, answer to if you understand my answer to that question, tell me. You can tell me quickly if you understand the, the reply to my question. And then, so you are typing. So the, your second question is for the chi-square statistic. How did you calculate the corresponding p-value? So the corresponding p-value, you can have it uh, from the tables. There are printed tables that you can read it, but it's more, more difficult. But with software, you can compute. Uh, there are functions that if you give them the value of the, of the statistic and the distribution of the statistic, it will give you back the p-value, like on R. For chi-square, on R you have a function named uh, the p kisk like this. So this function in R, the p kisk, if you give it uh, the value of the the value of the chi-square and the number of degrees of freedom, you will receive the p-value. Uh, and this, the other question is wisdom. Wisdom, how do you handle three allelic SNP? Say for a particular SNP position, you got uh, G, T, and C with G as major allele in terms of genotypes and contingency table and tests. Yeah, okay, and tests. Yeah, yeah, it's not a problem. That's, yeah, that's why uh, if you uh, look at the beginning, I was not saying SNPs, I was saying just a marker because it is also valid to a multi-allelic marker. If you have like three allele, you have just uh, to put all possible genotype that you have in row and you have your two column and you put the count and for, it, it's the same approaches. You can, you can compute it just the number of degrees of freedom of your chi-square test will increase because you increase the number of row of your table. And it's, even if it's also the likelihood version of, uh, of the test also, you, you will have probability of transmitting one instead of two or one instead of three. So instead of, you will not have only two probabilities, but you will have three probabilities, for example, one instead of two, one instead of three, two instead of three. So you will have here three probabilities if you have, for example, three SNP. So it's it's not a problem in the way that it is defined. You can easily extend it for 
uh, a marker with three, four, five alleles. Uh, the other question is Oscar. Okay, thanks Oscar. When the case status is highly dependent on age or sex, we will still not adjust for age or sex in an FBAT approach. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. You can, you can adjust. Like, if the case status depend on age and sex, like for sure you have to adjust uh, on age or, or sex. But the, 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 the inconvenience of the limitation of the basic TDT is that uh, you are not able to, to adjust because you have the case and you have just counting. So you don't include these other variables like age and sex in your, in your test. But if it's FBAT, you can use uh, uh, the, the adjusted trait because you are using the value of the trait time the, the genotype. When I say time the genotype, it's not really the genotype, it's time the observed genotype minus the expected genotype given the parent's genotype. Because when you have the parent's genotype, you, bef uh, before observing the offspring genotype, you can compute the expected offspring genotype, and then you make the difference between the expected genotype and the observed genotype, and then time the quantitative measure of the trait. And this quantitative measure of the trait can be the residuals. You can make, uh, before that, you know, uh, from a first step, you can make a regression model when you put age and sex in your model, and then uh, you take the residuals and that, uh, 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 from these residuals, so you are sure that you don't have now uh, the effect of age and sex in these residuals. And then uh, the residuals can be used as a new, new phenotype for FBAT. But yes, you can, say, you can say that the residuals also are estimates, so you are decreasing uh, your quantity of information by using the residuals, but it's, uh, it's a way to, to do it. So maybe there are some better methods to, to take that into account for FBAT. Uh, another question. Okay, so I think it was all the written question. If someone have a question, you have you can just raise your hand. Okay, thanks, Oscar. Thanks, yeah, I, I think I put, uh, when I start, I, I saw that I put a lot of materials in, in this course. I, I wanted to, to, um, to touch all type of uh, of design and all kind of models that are used but it's very very hard to fit that in one hour and a half that's 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 why yeah it's, we could not go deeply in in each of the slides so we that's that's the problem and it's a little bit tricky uh, to explain statistics someone is speaking Okay. Okay, so if there are so we can stop here and but
I, I think you have my email, so don't hesitate if you have later some questions in association methods uh, in, in, on, the, on the statistics. So I will have, I will be happy to to discuss and answer to you. It's, it, we will have more time. Okay, to um, I think that concludes in, the seventh and the last and lecture series of the HG 2018 um, GWAS lecture series. I'd like to say a big thank you to all the lecturers that have kindly given up the time to present. Um, starting with uh, Prof. Hazelhurst, Prof. Michelle Ramsey, Aitan Minches, Shor Aaron, Deity Sengupta, uh, Nyanya Chaudhary, and Dr. Sheikh Lokabar as well. And I'd like to thank you as the participants for persevering through this and for being available and attending all seven lectures. The lectures will be made available via YouTube and the slides will be put onto a fixed share repository for access. So thank you very much and thank you Sheikh for today's lecture. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, Sumir for your help, for your assistance. It's, it was very nice. I was happy to do this lecture. Yeah, thanks.